Hi there, welcome to Active Intelligence. I'm Aaron Ironside. Hopefully you've got half an hour to spare as we take a look at social issues from a variety of points of view. And today it's the one that has most of us talking online, but rarely in person. We talk about the COVID vaccinations and the freedom protests today on Active Intelligence. On today's program, I catch up with Pastor Sam Tolley. He's the campus pastor for a large church in West Auckland, Church Unlimited. And of course, churches have been right at the centre of this issue around the vaccination hesitancy and the recent freedom marches as well. When it comes to vaccine hesitancy, that seems to be a non-issue now. 90% of us have chosen to be vaccinated, but 10% remain hesitant. And some, of course, were not even sure that COVID was a real thing and whether the vaccine would even really help. And that's why, of course, many of us then started seeing some rather scary videos like this TikTok influencer who posted a plea to get vaccinated just nine days before she died of COVID-19. I shouldn't have waited. I think if, if you are even 70% sure that you want the vaccine, go get it. Don't wait. Go get it. Because hopefully... If you get it, then you won't end up in the hospital like me, okay? Of course, so many people don't believe that COVID is dangerous at all. In fact, if anything, they've come to believe that the vaccine is the thing that's dangerous. They're more afraid that you'll get sick and die from the vaccine. That's despite the fact that MedSafe keeps a very clear record of the side effects of the COVID-19 vaccine. And of course, uh, if anybody dies within a few weeks of taking the vaccine, they investigate as to whether or not it was the vaccine that caused that death. Remember, of course, when you're vaccinating an entire population, a large number of people will die within a few weeks of getting the vaccine simply because, well, they were going to die. And this is what happens when you have large groups of people do anything. Some of them will die shortly thereafter. So the question remains, was it the vaccine? Well, in one case, it would appear that even Dr. Ashley Bloomfield was willing to concede that the vaccine may have contributed to somebody's death. The, the risk of myocarditis after the vaccine is a lot lower than risk of myocarditis after being infected with COVID-19. So that's another point I'd make. And the key, the key, other key point is, and the reason we have put this out there, is to make people aware that this has happened, but also to make sure that uh, people being vaccinated and our health professionals are aware that if someone does present with chest pain or a bit of shortness of breath uh, or uh, palpitations, and they have recently been vaccinated, then they should look into that. And that's uh, uh, what part of the reason we've been very open about this case. And also it's of great interest um, internationally as well because it's one of the few cases where we've got the full range of evidence around the side effects and then able to explain this death. Well, the government is convinced, of course, that the vaccine is not deadly. It's very sad, of course, that that person did die from the vaccine. And of course, it's also sad that people have an adverse reaction to the vaccination. But of course, people have adverse reactions to all kinds of health uh, remedies, but that doesn't mean we stop using them. Uh, well, unfortunately, we've moved on, it seems, from vaccine hesitancy to lockdown hesitancy, which saw some uh, protests emerge around the country, the largest of which uh, was in Auckland. Uh, it got uh, rescheduled from being a march down Queen Street to a gathering in Auckland Domain, and it would appear that the church community was right at the centre of it. A parade of opposition. Our freedoms, our rights are being assaulted before our eyes. Auckland's third freedom rally was its biggest yet. Police say 5,000 people descended on the domain today, all fed up with the system. The people have had a guts for. And those people had many different faces, from parents who wanted better for their children. I've got three, uh, three kids under five. You know, they're getting robbed of their childhood, man to media haters, lockdown loathers, Trump supporters, and teachers who don't support the vaccine mandate. We have to have a jam. And if we don't, then we've got to hit the road jam. 
But the man many people wanted to see most, Brian Tamaki, was nowhere to be seen. My husband is heartbroken and he couldn't be here today. I have practically begged him to stay put. Having already been arrested twice for his involvement in previous protests, he was warned in court that another misstep would land him in jail. But that didn't stop the group from taking to the streets. Thousands of people have shut down the streets of Newmarket this afternoon. They're angry, they feel like they're not being listened to, and they're calling for more freedom. With case numbers at an all-time high, this march may well turn into a super spreader event. While some people wore masks, they were in the minority. And social distancing, well, forget it. Similar protests were held around the country, with hundreds turning out in Wellington. And that's where this group is hoping their message will be heard. The ninth floor of the Beehive. Well, perhaps to get a little closer to that ninth floor of the Beehive, what was needed was a protest right at the Beehive. And in fact, that's exactly what we saw recently. And unfortunately, whilst most people, when they protest, do it peacefully, uh, there was some behaviour that, well, frankly, had many of us shaking our heads. Unprecedented. The country's parliament locked down. And here's why. Protesters tearing through the barricades on the front steps, raising fears reminiscent of the US Capitol riots. But then, because it's not the States, it's New Zealand, they politely put them back up again. And despite the echoes of America, thankfully this was not. Armed instead with tennis balls biffing them at police and media, along with a few chocolate chip cookies and a bit of bile. You're an embarrassment to us, the media and the government. Look at you all with your face nappies on. It wasn't just the predictable targets. At one point, the protesters also turned on themselves. Exception taken to a dancing protester who was forcibly removed twice from the inner sanctum. Although some of the messaging was inconsistent. 1080 is a diabolical sin that should be banned forever. Pretty much the sick of our freedom has been taken away from us. It was delivered en masse with protesters coming from all over Level 2 New Zealand. But the welcome mat was not rolled out. Get vaccinated, you dipshit. Oh, it's pretty lame. It's pretty ridiculous. Everyone should just go out and get vaccinated. It strikes me that they don't know the proper medical information. It all began with a civil start in Civic Square. Turning up the volume as the protest burnt its way through Wellington. Protesting by bike, by foot, for the smaller of the crowd, by shoulder and for anti-vax lawyer Sue Gray on a wave of applause. Both on the scene and behind the scenes, this was one of the largest police operations at Parliament. The police commissioner confident as he got to work. Are you planning for it to get aggressive? We have plans in place, so I won't go into the detail, but I'm happy with where we're at with it. All precautions taken. Have there been any threats of firearms? I, I, I don't think it would be appropriate for me to make any comments on intelligence that we've received. A lot of the vitriol from anti-vaxxers is directed at Jacinda Ardern. Yes, I do run my own uh, social media, so of course I, um, I get a slice of that, but I'm very clear that that's not indicative of the vast bulk of New Zealanders. The protesters, also a tiny minority, way more people were vaccinated just today than were marching, but still. I'm obviously concerned. I've never seen Parliament locked up like this. MPs watched from inside, warned not to head outside, though after being spotted at an anti-vax protest in Whanganui last week, National MP Hare Te Hipango was considering it. Will you be going out to the protest today? I could be, you'll see. I don't know at the moment. Quickly kiboshed by Collins. Have any of your MPs expressed a desire well, to Well, I've made it really clear that I don't think that that is the right thing to do. Uh, this is very much an anti-vaccination protest and we don't want to really be seen with it. And it wasn't the only one today up at the Tehana border north of Auckland. Dozens of protesters blocked the road for about an hour. Nice and peaceful, lovely day. Got your sunscreen on. Peaceful until one of the protesters bit a police officer. So now we're fighting for our freedoms since we've stopped fighting against the vaccination programme.
And many can understand that uh, the limitations that may be placed upon those who are unvaccinated seem difficult to understand. I, for one, don't understand why once we have 90% vaccination, that those who are unvaccinated have to choose for themselves where they'll go and uh, what risks they'll expose themselves to. Of course, churches are one group who are very anxious about being told that people who are normally part of their community might not be welcome. It's just one of the many issues that churches have had to face over the last couple of years when a community that was so used to being in person was suddenly online. I caught up with Pastor Sam Tully from Church Unlimited in West Auckland to explore some of the challenges of church life in COVID. Uh, Aaron, where do we start? I mean... You know, first of all, no prep for this at all. I remember going into New Zealand's lockdown last year in 2020, and we're like, what are we in for? Uh, Are you prepping? Are we going to be out for a week? And then it drags on, and and you're thinking, are we going to be able to, how many staff are we going to have to lose? Are we going to have to lay people off? And just the complete uncertainty, and then in and out of lockdowns, and people's fear and worry. And then we come to this year, and I'm sure we're going to talk about vaccinated and unvaccinated, uh, not knowing what the plans are, having to work from home, keeping people motivated, um, having people's mental health in your hands. I think that's been a big stress. Oh, it, I just need it to be over from a pastoral point of view. We need People need contact and we just can't see them. We. Uh, like we used to and zoom's not really all that it's cracked out to be well let's talk about the contact that many of us have been having for the last couple of years and that's online and it would appear that online means that somehow we lose our sense of how to be kind how to be gracious we'll say things online that we would never say in person certainly the way we're willing to say things is often a lot more aggressive have you been surprised at how people who normally act so well towards each other in community life can be sort of racked up by lockdown and by the whole COVID experience. I am preaching a message um, soon that is called I Never Thought. And I never thought churches would be experiencing what we're experiencing and the divide and the opinions. People are so strongly opinionated amongst, even between family members who used to be so on the same page of how they would think politically and socially and now that just the divide is just massive and and people are posting things up that they I guess from my point of view they're going man I know this is right and yet it, to be honest it's all their opinions and everyone's got strong opinions um, and now it, it, it matters and I'm just I, I'm, I'm not as surprised about the the language and the strength of it, but just how much, how divisive it's been. Aaron, I just can't, I can't believe it. That I just never thought it would be like this, and I'm shocked and I'm worried from a church point of view the the division that's coming in place, but also from a society point of view. How can we have, let's say, ten percent of a nation isolated, and we we don't want to be part of you? I mean, I never thought this was going to happen. Well, that's one particular issue that we will cover today, but let's take a step back if we can, because when the conversation began just over a year ago, a lot of the conversations and fears were labelled conspiracy theories. Was COVID even a real thing or something something invented to lock us in our homes so the government could take control? What was 5G and where did it fit into the equation? And conspiracy theories abound. And it seemed to me, and maybe because so many many of my social media friends are within the faith community, that it seemed like Christians seemed more likely to accept or believe the most extreme, the conspiracy theories, perhaps more than other people. Do you think that assessment is is fair? Is that some confirmation bias? Because I mostly know Christian people. Probably we're in the same place. And Aaron, you're a you know, you, you're a bit of a psychologist. You may understand that a bit more. I go back to what we think, what you're talking about. In um, 2020, as we get locked down, all the 5 g towers are going up and a big tower goes up right outside our church and we're thinking, oh, what's going on? And my take is, as Christians, we believe, and there is, there's one true living God. He's bigger. He's more powerful. There's good versus evil. And so we 
we see the bigger picture going on and when there's things that don't fit our narrative it causes us to question so many things and i think it gets really easy to jump down rabbit holes because in some ways um we know that things are going to go bad and in, in time revelation is pretty clear about it but it we're jumping down there too fast. And I just can't believe some of the things that people are coming out with that, that they call them tin hats or flat earthers. And But the reality is they believe it and they they really almost feel like they've, they've heard from God that this is right. And when people use that language they've heard from God, you can't argue with that because we're taught to have our own faith. And as a pastor, I don't want to stop people from trying to listen to God for themselves but then you need to bring some correction to it and it just gets so difficult. And I remember back to when it started coming out and you're like, guys, a whole, just pause for a second and just stop and think and, and really process who are you getting this information from? And and really, is, is this really what you believe or are you just so uncertain? And I think that's a big part of it, Aaron. We're uncertain. This is unprecedented. We've never been here before. How do we think? How should we respond to situations that we've just never seen? I, I want to drill into this idea of, of correcting or advising people here, because it seemed online that people had come to teach, not to learn. They wanted to teach other people what they believed, what, what they had learned in their own research and weren't very willing or open or receptive to any other points of view. What was part of that, of course, was this infodemic, the, the sickness of our culture in terms of knowing who to trust, where do I get trustworthy information from? And so somehow uh, the Ashley Bloomfields, the Anthony Fauci's of this world, even though it was their job to know what to do, were tarred with the conspiracy. How did you as a pastor fare? Did you discover that, that you were someone who, who could be trusted by your people? I think people trust people in the area of expertise. And unfortunately, we haven't been wanting to trust the people who are experts in the certain areas that we don't want to believe. And that's where everyone's become an expert in areas where they've not studied, they've not have the experience and, and anyone who has had the experience, we don't like what they're saying, so we're discrediting what they're saying. And and my take is I'm not a medical expert. I have been a pastor for 18 years. I understand that world. I know how to speak to that. But then that's not speaking to the thing that they're focusing on, which is the medical side or the theories about different things. And so all of a sudden, I'm no expert. and. And even when you point them back to scripture, they're like, yeah, but that doesn't address my specifics. And and it's kind of like we're jumping down to the real narrow little point, but there's something bigger going on here. And I think that's the reality is we can't, uh, from a Christian point of view, we can't get lost in the real minute details. We've got to see bigger than this and go, actually, God is still in control. He knows what's going on. I don't know, but I trust God. And it's like people have gone, oh, I don't. I don't trust what the government's saying, and I don't trust what experts saying, but they've almost lost trust in to say, God, I still trust you. And I think we've got to come back to that. God, I trust that you're in control and I can hold on to you, even though everything else doesn't make sense. But my experience has been older, wiser people who have been educated. Those are the ones that I can trust and I, I need to know who they are. And all of a sudden, some guy who looks like he's wearing a bow tie, we believe him. Well, why should we believe him? Who is he even? And that's what I, it's just doing my head in. And you, no one's fact checking anything. They just like what they're saying. And then they're saying, now I believe that. Well, there's a couple of big issues now that the church seems to be front and center with. One is the issue of freedom itself. Uh, rightly or wrongly, the church has been uh, identified as the group that is somehow behind the protests, the gatherings in the domain, uh, the visible protest against the lockdowns, against the restrictions. And then, of course, as a subset of that, uh, very much a voice saying, hey, this idea that those who are unvaccinated won't be welcome among us, uh, that isn't going to fly for the church. I'm concerned in terms of these battles because I know in the wider story that the community looking on 
doesn't see the church as advocating for the safety of the community. Uh, they see the church as being the ones who are reckless, the ones who are willing to go and gather and potentially have super spreader events. Do we have to be careful here that we don't uh, win the battle but lose the war? Absolutely. Yeah, I, I, absolutely. And I first of all, I want to say I don't have all the answers. And the reason why I don't have all the answers, Aaron, is because I don't have all the information. And, and I, I'm concerned that churches are making decisions, and yet we don't even know what everything's going to look like. Number one, I believe the gospel should be available to everyone. I don't think there should be segregation. But at the same time, um, I'm not in government, and I'm speaking to people in government, but ultimately they're making the rules, and the Bible's also clear that unless those rules are going against what's clearly put in Scripture, how can how should we live and and it's like you've got one side where you want to uphold freedom but on the other hand you're like yeah but what about public health and safety and and you've got one side of the group going give us freedom we should be able to, allowed to do everything and you've got the other side from a health point of view saying keep the unvaccinated away from us and and we're like but we're one family we're one body we're a church and and the simple thing is there is no answer there isn't an answer because um, we've never been this way before. Um, my personal take, and I think this is what I want to say, I'm not speaking on behalf of Church Unlimited or, or anyone else, is I, I personally feel we need to be able to meet together. And I want to see the church meeting. And I, my take is I'd like to see everyone meet. But right now we can't. So how do we get as many of us meeting as possible? And how can we get... Um, Maybe if the government's going to force us to have uh, separate things, how do we get the unvaccinated meeting together and the vaccinated meeting together? We need to find ways so that we can come back together because God didn't create us to be isolated. We need to come together and we need to connect. We need to support and we need to be there for each other and put aside our differences and focus on actually the health of individuals and families in the community. Well, on that note, let me give you the two scenarios then that appear to be the choice of many pastors to see, in a sense, which is worse. On the one hand, we've got our freedom problem, that unvaccinated people are told, you need to stay home. They feel cut off from Christian community, uh, from those relationships. The church itself feels like it's not whole. Those people aren't present, and somehow it can't be who it wants to be. But on the other hand, the other scenario is, so the unvaccinated are welcome. Well, what happens if one of those unvaccinated people who has no immunity, no, presumably no natural or vaccinated immunity to COVID, was to somehow contract that virus during a church service and become terribly ill? I mean, as a church, neither scenario seems that appealing. How do you navigate that complexity? I think the reality is we've got to come back to what is central to the gospel. And as a church, the, the thing that's most central to the gospel um, and to Christianity is the fact that Jesus died on the cross and that we're to go out and share that message. Now, if the Church of New Zealand makes a stand and that makes um, the gospel unappealing to people, then we're we're doing something that's damaging, not just right now, but long term. And I think we need to stop and pause and look at the bigger picture for a moment. And for me, the bigger picture is where should the church be standing? And and I think the church should be helping people and being there for people as much as we can, um, while not trying to have mass spreader events, because the last thing I want to have is everyone in New Zealand knowing who Church Unlimited is, because somebody came along with COVID or somebody caught COVID and then they died or somebody had COVID and they came along and now all of a sudden hundreds of people have um, caught COVID in Auckland or West Auckland because of that. And it's like, well, what's the balance here? And I think we need to see that just because we've always done church a certain way doesn't mean it's not time to be innovative. And I think that's my key is let's stop looking at the problem and go the government or COVID is stopping us from doing things a certain way and going actually the key thing here is it's about people meeting together, being able to worship one true living God, being able to support each other and does that have to be in one large gathering? What can it look like? And actually start going actually just because it doesn't look the way it used to look doesn't mean it's against God and I think people I want to meet together. I want to have a thousand people in my service. But the reality is maybe 
for a season it can't look that way and that might not be a bad thing we just have to realize it's a preference it's not a foundation of the gospel that we can have you know unlimited size gatherings one of the things you've pointed out here is the way in which we combine our faith and our politics because there is this sense isn't there that if your politics is more conservative in nature you're likely to struggle with the restriction on freedom and if your politics is more progressive or liberal in nature you're more likely to favor the public health and yet we make a case for our belief through our faith so it sounds like it's a faith position but it might really just be a christianized version of a political position what's the lesson moving forward for people of faith to learn the difference between their politics and their faith well i think the, the key thing is is we we try and bring them together but we've got to see that there's something different here the difference is, is the reality is our faith is about god and our relationship with him and then how we bring him into our world and and we can bring politics in that but so often we've got to go well how do we do this in relation to what I think is important to the foundation of my faith, that every life is important and every life matters. And without a relationship with God, then the ultimate big question is, where is their eternal destiny? And does it matter whether we support uh, freedom or business or social needs? Well, actually, I think that's all important in the gospel and just actually we got to learn to be united and put aside our differences my take is we can be in new zealand we can be a national supporter or a labor supporter an act or a green supporter and all have faith and all work together in advancing the kingdom and realize that some of these things are just minor points in a much bigger detail and i think we've We've tried to um, hold up our differences and go, well, there we can't be united. Well, the reality is we can be united. And I think some of these political stances are two sides of the same coin. And we need to start learning that as, as Christians and as the body of Christ, that we can agree to disagree on some of these things because it doesn't really matter. That's not what it is at the heart of the gospel. Pastor Sam Tully there with some very wise words, particularly around the fact that we must not confuse our politics with our faith. Uh, in fact, the faith needs to come first. It's a kind of a, a big idea. Politics, of course, is an attempt to make sense of our world in the here and now. And so uh, we have to be able to hold those both in tension with each other. But there was one particular comment that might have slipped by that I want to focus you in on. And that was simply that Sam, when I asked him if he was trusted to talk about COVID, actually said, hold on, I'm not a medical professional. He was able to identify his lane. He knows what he's an expert on and what he's not. He knows he's an expert on the Bible, on the Christian faith and the life of his community. But he's not an expert on COVID and was reluctant, therefore, to be drawn into having an opinion. I wish more people could adopt that point of view. We all want to be experts, but so few of us are. So let's let the experts be the experts. Let's leave it up to the medical professionals to tell us about the vaccine. How many people think that they are an expert or claim to have done research when frankly they couldn't understand a piece of medical research if they read it? I know I couldn't and I'm a pretty smart fella, but I know that there's lots of words and terms and ideas in those papers that I wouldn't understand. I rely on the experts. I rely on my doctor, not on Google to be my doctor. That's why we have experts. They've earned the right to speak. We have to learn again to let the experts speak and let the experts disagree. But most importantly, to let the experts decide. Because I can't think of many areas in life where my choice trumps the expert. I think my accountant knows better about my tax return than I do. I know for sure my doctor knows better what things I should be putting in my body to be well than I do. Do we trust the experts? Now, I realize that there's a class of self-made expert that has power. They're called politicians. And some of them want to be experts, but are not. But they do have responsibility, even if they don't always have expertise. 
So I think the challenge now for us moving forward is we'll learn to talk to each other a lot more kindly when we're humble enough to admit when we're not an expert. Because if we could have confessed just that one thing, you can still have your opinion, but you're allowed to express it as exactly that. An opinion, a thought, a feeling, and therefore not necessarily engage in the battle of the facts or tell other people who disagree that they are fools or don't believe the truth. Let's just concede. We have opinions. You're allowed, and the good thing is, they're calorie free. Like to hear your opinion, you can get in touch, activeintelligence.nz. On the website, make sure you click that subscribe button and we'll send every episode straight into your inbox. And I'll catch you next time on Active Intelligence.